So with the panels done, we can finally get back to these drawer tiers and start putting all the parts together and getting the webbing in that I actually thought I was going to be on about a month ago. Now I set up the scaffolding like I did in the initial video to, with the mock, but I now have the real cabinet on here, but you're looking at it from the back side. Because what we want to do is design this column that's going to go up in the middle on the back of it and figure out its location and placement. So there have never been any boards cut for the back yet. That's always been left. But I didn't really want to cut any of the wood, like a piece that goes all the way across back here and then end up cutting out about a foot of it in the middle. So that's partly what we're going to be doing here. We're going to design the back column and then afterwards I'll be cutting some of the boards that go here. So if you recall from the very first episode, which has actually been a really long time, this is taking me forever. <laughs> what I was talking about doing for the column is in a way we have an angle over here for the side and then there's an angle for the side on the other side. What I wanted to do is you could picture this going down to a point where there could be a pivot point. So in a way you have a window wiper that could go back and forth and it would be right al along the side here and then it would go right along the side there. In a way what I want to do is use that window wiper idea to figure out well there's going to be a side here and as, as it swings there could be a side here for that column. I want the column to have sort of a proportional taper to the sides of the cabinet. I think that'll make it look nice. Now we could always change that a little bit but I do want it to kind of follow at least the sides here. So this is the piece that's in the front. It's between these faceted sides. Uh, to me, I want to kind of make the proportion based on this flat front as opposed to the faceted sides. Because in a way, when you're looking at it from the center, which is normally where you're going to see it as a entertainment center, those faceted sides kind of feather off uh, you know, the view. What you're seeing, they kind of feather that off. So it's not really, to me, part of the width of the cabinet. You know, to you, the visual part is going to be the flat part in the middle. So in looking at this, I was really thinking that you know, in a way you can almost take a third of it and put that would be the column part in the center. But I don't really want it to be a third, I want it to be just a hair smaller than a third. It seems like if it, as soon as it hits that one third mark, your eyes see that as a third and it makes it look overly big. So my plan was to make the top part of the column just a hair under a third size. So let me put some cardboard up and then we can start doing some drawing. Now if we go for the idea of a third, we have 32 inches from here to there, so it's going to be just a little over 10 inches for a one third. But as I mentioned, I think it would actually look better if it was just a little bit smaller than the one third. So let's just assume it's going to be 10 inches. So if we doodle that on here for the board, so the blue tape makes it a little bit more obvious to see. So that's a 10 inch long piece of blue tape. Now when I'm looking at that, to me that looks like a nice proportion. I mean, I did look at this a little bit before I started rolling the camera. So now in the original design episode, I had talked about possibly making this rounded. So the column would have a rounded front to it and then when it came out to the top it'd have a rounded top on it so the idea of sort of juxtaposing the rounded parts with all these angular parts uh, the more i was thinking about it the more i kind of like a different design it might be because it happens that the other design is like a thousand times easier to do than all this rounding and trying to shape a top while having a continuous grain uh, for especially a hollow column so what the thought is is to continue the taper up and then maybe on the top you're just going to cap it off and then you're going to create a bevel on that edge. So in that case, it mirrors some of the design proportions that were done on the main cabinet. But because it's a different material, it's a little bit of a different taper, it should look really good. I'm hoping. Now just to explain how this works, this bottom piece is not sitting on the ground. There's actually three inches of clearance between this and a box that's going to be used to support the whole thing. The box is going to be out of Wenge and it's going to be square. It's not going to be tapered like this. So it's going to add sort of that pedestal foot that we really want. So if we continue to use this idea of the one third, then when we get down here, we're talking about a little over 18 inches between here to here. So we can go for about a six inch. So that'll be the width of the taper down below. So it'll continue to taper up. It'll continue to widen up as it gets up here. And then up there is where we're going to add sort of the top is just going to clip off flat and square but then I'm going to add a bevel all the way around it, similar to this. And creating that taper on the top will be kind of easy with that Itome because I'm going to be cutting that as a veneer. So it'll be veneered all onto the column and then at the top, you know, we can do some work to bend it down and create the facets. So whenever I've looked at this, I really like the taper that we've got going and the widths that we've got going here on the inside. So I taped in where the edges of this column are going to go and carried them up to basically more or less the top of this. Now, if we continued this along and I want to go I don't know, you know, a nice height might be, oh, about this high. <laughs> That's how I'm doing the measurement. Hey, that looks like about eight inches. So just putting a little piece of tape there, the top of the tape is the eight inch mark. So that would make for a pretty nice 
projection off the top of the cabinet. If we were to put this here to sort of pretend that this was actually the front, what you would see is about that tall. So if you put a vase there or something, I mean, most of those are going to be taller. The thing that would be nice is that the backdrop of the cabinet is still going to be below the vase, right? It's not going to be trying to surround it. I mean, you could do that on a cabinet. It would look really good if you were trying to feature some sort of piece of art where you might actually want that background to, to frame it. But in this case here, we don't know what's going to go there, so we don't really want it to be that tall. Now, in my case, what's going to end up being on the top is kind of undetermined. Even though this is an entertainment center, I've kind of singled out this shelf here is where the amplifier will go. So it's been sized, you know, all these proportions were built around making sure that the stereo that I'm interested in is going to be able to fit there. I don't really want too much on the top. I'd actually like to keep that as open as possible. But it turns out that if I actually did want to put, say, the amplifier on the top to give it a lot more room for, for the air to get out and just because maybe I like the look of it better, it turns out that the amplifier is shorter than this. So this will actually project just a little bit above and that should look really good. But I don't know now, do I want this to be where the end of the facet is? Is this where it's going to come up to here and then I'm going to create the facet inclusive of this measurement or do I create the facet above it? Is that where the facet starts? So I think I'm actually going to put it above for the same reason that I've been considering these facets as not really part of the width. So I'm going to choose to do the facet on the top. So just eyeballing something, a facet, you know, about an inch tall in projection, so about an inch and a half on an angle, if it's a 45 degree angle, is going to look about good to me. So now while it looks like I'm just totally winging this here, I did do a little bit of this drawing ahead of time, but very much this is the process that I was doing. I was kind of taking different measurements. Uh, in my case, I was just using some pencil lines on some other cardboard, as opposed to using all the tape. I've used enough tape on this project. But that's how I came around to some of these numbers, by just looking at them and trying to decide, well, what am I going to use it for and how is it going to get recommissioned? Because not everybody's going to want to use it for an entertainment center. So that being the top of this overall column taper, it's going to be at the top. If I were to draw this in as having the you know, diagonal for the back taper, or for the bevel that is, then that might be what it's going to look like. It's just going to get a little bit of a recess back. Now the column itself is going to be fairly thick. so. I might end up making this a little bit taller, depends. I wouldn't mind a really steep angle going back a little ways. It doesn't have to go all the way back, but I have the choice of being able to maybe make it a little bit steeper. So I've talked about this column as being a way of passing cables between the different layers and you're not going to be able to see all those. Originally I thought that maybe I would be able to do something on that panel that's in the back of each one of these layers so that you could maybe have a small access part that you can pop out and you could run the cables directly into it so they can get into the column. Uh, the more I thought about that and the more I looked at it, it seemed like no matter what, if I ever recommissioned it as something other than an entertainment center, you would see this little thing that looks like a panel in the back. No, no matter what you do, there's going to be a gap around it or some changes around it. And it's going to be really hard to hide. And it would be really hard to hide even in the column itself, like having a small section of the bottom of the column that could be removed if you're using it to pass wires and then you could put it back and it might you know, kind of disappear and hide on you. It might be the case that we'll find that out later, but right now what I'm thinking is if I put a component back here, it'll be very easy to take the wires that are off of it and just wrap it around the edge of the column and then they pop in on the side. The entire back of this column will be like a piece of hardboard that's got some magnets on it to snap on. So we'll be able to access, get the wires into there no matter what. And the only thing is if you're looking at it from the side, you'd see the wires go whoop, swoop in. Not very difficult to hide, but it's not quite as... If this was only going to be an entertainment center, you could certainly make some small access holes to get those wires in, but it just doesn't seem like that's going to really work with a piece like this. So now with this drawn, pretty much I can take some measurements here to get a rough idea of how far this piece has to go in order to reach the column. It's going to need to go a little ways in so that it can actually attach to the column, the portion of the column that's on the inside of all this veneering. So that's where we're going with this right now is that we're going to, we've got this plan, I'll get the numbers for it so that I'll go ahead and off camera we'll take care of making the back so when you come back we'll have all the backs all already cut but the next step that we need to do is we need to put these panels into these tiers so that we can actually determine how much room we have in the middle for doing the drawer webbing and there's about three or four different ways I've considered of doing the drawer webbing so we'll talk about that after we get the rabbiting done. So I'm finally back in the shop it's been almost two months uh, to the day since I recorded the previous part of what you saw in this clip I'm not sure how this is going to look when it's all done but that that part there two months ago so I took down the scaffolding actually just this morning so that I could 
show you the rest of what we're going to be doing here for the build. Now, I did sneak into the shop about uh, a week and a half ago. I needed to get away from my, my crazy work project, and I wanted to finish what are the backs for these units. Now, You're looking at the back of this lower assembly. So if I were to spin this around, you, know, you can see that there's a slight incline to the front. That's for part of the front of this diamond, but the back is going to be dead straight. So these ones have been cut so that this back is going to be straight up. Now you're going to wonder if I'm back to my half inch shy problem of cutting things too short. There's going to be the column that goes down the middle. Now I don't want, I'm not going to cut a bunch of wood all the way full size exactly to the right length and stuff like that when I'm going to be then removing it later. Now the reason why I left these solid even though they're short and I didn't split them yet is because it's going to be easier for me to put the rabbits in and the tops and the bottoms in order for us to put the panels in place. Remember, we've got these panels hiding around here, and fortunately, they're still flat after being ignored all this time. Uh, so we're gonna need to put a rabbit into the top here and bottom for supporting the panels. So what's tricky about this is that we need this rabbit on this board that's got an incline. So this, bottom, this side piece here, you know, I'm gonna need to have a bottom of the rabbit that's gonna be parallel to this top. So if I were to just pencil that in a little bit, and then of course the side is gonna go vertical, just straight vertical, plumb has nothing to do with e any of these sides here. So we're making kind of an unusual notch there for this rabbit to go all the way around. So I considered a couple different ways of doing it. One way is, well, then let me just assemble the whole thing as a box, and then you can do the trick where you go to a router table and you have the router bit sticking up with the rabbiting head and the, the little bearing on there, and then you take this and you just move it around onto the tabletop so that you're gonna be making the rabbit all the way around. Now the problem I have with that is because of the inclines, that bearing is gonna to touch at different positions. It's gonna give us different depths of cut into the part that you see on the top. So the reveal along the outer edge here is gonna be different depending on the inclination of the, of the side that you're up against. You know, the other problem is that the corners are all gonna be rounded. Now that can look good actually if you're making say a jewelry box you can make that so it has a rounded recess inside it and round the corners of the lid so you know it gives it a nice look but for this I really wouldn't want them to be rounded especially when everything is so angular so I need to have those corners squared off and you know the prospect of hand squaring off eight per layer so that's going to be 16 per uh, per drawer layer and then there's three of those so now we're up to 48 and then times two up to 96. I don't want to do that many corners, so I don't want to do the router method. Now another method for doing rabbits is to simply take a board and you run it onto the table saw. If you use the table saw method, you can just use a regular blade, but you're going to be doing two cuts, one for the one part and one for the other part, and a little piece comes out. That works perfectly when you're going to have a rabbit like this where it's going to be completely concealed no matter where. It's never revealed out the outside because you're never really going to get that corner to be dead perfect. And in fact, if you're doing a joint for a panel like this, and I use that technique, I actually tend to try overcutting in both directions. So you have a little bit of a glue recess there in the back. But the way you would do that is normally if the board was square, you know, you'd run it vertically like this so that you make the one cut and then you put it flat and run it across so that you pull out the corner that becomes the rabbit. Now for these boards on an incline, that means, okay, the first one would be easy. We could put it flat tilt the blade so it's parallel to this outside edge, get that one cut. But then for the other cut, we have to actually hold this board up. And because of the tilt of the saw and the tilt of this board, you're gonna have to hold it like this while the blade is cutting up like that. And you're gonna have this against the fence. That to me doesn't seem very safe. I wouldn't wanna do that. On this board, I wouldn't wanna do that. And I especially wouldn't wanna do it on this board. So I needed a better solution. So the solution that I'm picking is I'm gonna be using a dado stack. A lot of times you're going to do this type of work if you're doing regular square work, you'd be using a dado stack anyway. So with the dado stack, we can make cut for the entire rabbit. Now in this case here, what's unusual about what we're going to be doing here is that when I run this board and I have it flat like this on the table saw deck, I'm going to have the dado stack tilted to this angle that's out here. Exactly like when I cut this, it'll be the same angle, same calculation, everything. So that'll end up putting a rabbit onto the edge. Now the one thing is because my saw is just a left tilt, I mean left or right you're going to have only one side and you're going to have to move the fence to the other. We'll have to move the fence to the other side so that the blade comes up and cuts this one. But 
that's all fine. That's going to be really easy to do with this, and I would feel perfectly safe doing that. So then comes these little puppies. How are we going to do these? For these, we're going to go back to the sled. So with the sled, when I put this on, it's square to the edge here. That's actually how I cut this bevel that's on the outside edge is by putting it there. So we're basically going to run the dado stack. I'm going to have this on there. Dado stack is going to be cutting the rabbit into the edge when it's like that. So now the one catches again. This is that whole left tilt, right tilt thing. I'm going to have to then cut the other side by taking this and putting it on this side here to make the cut. So, so I'll be buzzing the edge of this off so that we can do the other side. We'll just shift it over to the other miter slot. So it turns something that would be really awkward and difficult using the same setup and all the same triangles that I have prepared already into something that's pretty easy to do. So nothing can be easy. So there's got to be something else that becomes difficult. So there is a small part that does become difficult, but we can easily overcome that. And what that is, is how am I going to know where I make the cut? How high do I bring the blade? It's not like I can set the blade height and just, oh, let me just go. What's going to be easier is to simply mark on the boards where the cuts need to be, where this bottom line needs to, to start, you know, where it starts on the outside edge here, and where it starts on the, on the top part here. Once I have those two marks, for each board, I would then position it across until the dado stack is going to start cutting at the right place, and then just adjust the height until I have it correct. Uh, that sounds like a lot of adjustment, but fortunately, this board and this board, as well as the two on the other layers and the top layer, they're all going to have pretty much the same setting, only, pos only the position of where the board is located, so the fence position. And that's a pretty easy one to do. But we're going to see all that when I get to the saw. What I want to talk about, though, is how we're going to set the reveal and all that. <clears throat> now, for the reveal on the top, what I'm talking about is the distance that you're always going to, when I put the panel in, what distance is going to be shown of this regular curly maple all the way around. I want that to be consistent regardless of the inclination that's on the panel. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to set this marking gauge and I'm going to set it to some kind of arbitrary that looks good. <laughs> so with this I can go around using this top edge the outside edge here that's going to be just a perfect way for me to make a line all the way across. So once I have that edge marked on the top, how am I going to know where to make the cut onto the inside? Now for that it's going to be easier for you to see on the side here. The easiest way, normally the way that you'll do these rabbits, is that you're going to take the panel, you would, you would set your marking gauge to, wow, that was actually perfect the way I set it by, by eye there. So in my case, it's set just a little bit thicker than this panel because I want to make sure that I have material here that I can trim down to get it flush. I don't want this sticking up. So normally that's how you would use this to figure out, well, what's the depth? So the way that you can do it is that, well, I can go across the top here, keeping this flat against the, the top that we have, and I can mark it. So the distance from the top Actually, when you look at the board on the flat, so the distance from here to that cut line is going to be different depending on the inclinations. But overall, from the top of the panel, the top of the box, it's going to be the same. So it turns out this one here is too small for doing that, right? I can't, this is the greatest incline and it's really kind of hard to get registered well. I mean, I can, but it's not the best. So what I'll use instead is I have a marking gauge that's got a much larger foot. It's almost like a mini panel gauge here. But with this, I can very easily get strong registration across that whole top for making the marks. Okay, so let's go to the saw. There's a couple things that are different about using the dado stack on an inclination like that that we're going to need to talk about. But for the most part, it's all easy peasy from here on out, I think. So I have everything ready to go here at the table saw so we can go run through and get some of these rabbits done because there's, there's an awful lot of them to do. Uh, we'll go through a couple of the simpler cases, like the simple case here. These are boards that can go strictly up against the side of the fence. So I can scoot this over once I have the blade angled at the right angle. Just push these things through, very easily done. And then I'll show you how we're going to do the smaller pieces on the sled. Then after that, just you know, turn off the camera and go crank through all these sides. Now for setting up the blade, the blade is going to be set the same way. I I'm using the angle master for setting the angle on here because I still have all the numbers that I calculated previously, like the number that I used for cutting the initial top and bottom bevel. 
But at this point, you could actually just transfer this. So we could use a transfer bevel to take a reading directly off the board. And then we could transfer that to the, the stack that we've got here. So if we tilt this back, you know, I can just push this little bevel gauge up. And now that I've gotten that directly off the stock, I can put it over here and I can tilt the blade over until I've got it to the same angle. So I don't need to use this, but of course, since I've got the number sitting there and it's a lot easier and faster with that, that's how I'm gonna be doing it. Now I did mark the little rectangle of what we're gonna be eliminating with this blade on the first pass. Now, all we care about really are the two marks that I made with the lines that you're not gonna be able to see on the camera at all. Now I did bring the two gauges over. This one here I have set for doing what is the top. It's always gonna be used for the top setting. And then this one here is always set for what would be when it's inclined so that I can make the mark onto the inside. So between the two, I didn't go around and mark all of them. I did just one layer so that we could do this here. But the rest of them, I'm just gonna mark them as I go. And I only really need to mark the part that's gonna get set for the setup. So that's what we're gonna be removing. Of course, right now, it doesn't even look at all like we're gonna be able to do that. But let's go ahead and tilt this blade to the correct angle. And you're gonna see how just it's gonna work just as is. I will say this is the first time I ever tilt a dado stack. All right, there we go. So now let me lower this blade so it's probably closer to where it's actually really gonna be for doing this cut. And now it should be kind of clear from the other camera view that this is gonna do the correct type of cut. It's gonna be the, the flat top of this dado stack is gonna give me, and because of the way that it's angled, it's gonna give me that angled down edge. And then what's gonna happen is that this, when it's mounted, assembled together, this notch here, it goes down straight plumb. So the square edge of my panel is gonna fit in there just fine. So this will make cutting the panel square. I don't have to put bevel cuts or anything on that. I'll just have to, unfortunately, do all the eight cuts around and get them to fit perfectly. So now I don't have a throat plate in here right now for cutting on this. It's gonna be just perfectly fine when it's getting pushed through because I've got plenty of meat over here. The time when that's gonna become a problem though, this whole thing of it being open, is when I'm dealing with some of this stock here. This is for the top bevel, that part that makes the diamond on the very top. Now on this one here, you can see that when I go to put this cut in, I'm completely in the open. Now, granted, this is a long piece, so you know you could kind of hold it down here, then once it starts to straddle to the other end, you can start pulling there, but that just seems rot with error. <laughs> so the way that we're gonna be doing those, and I'm not gonna do that on camera, I'm just gonna explain it here. Basically, the way I'm gonna do it is I'm gonna have a board like this. This is my you know universal sacrificial board. I'm gonna be putting this on here. I'm gonna put the board on there as well, and then I'm gonna line up the blade correctly as far as scooting it over so that this fence is right up against where I need it and then it's at the right place. Remember, because this is at an angle, uh, I have to account for this thickness in positioning the blade. But it's really easy. It's still, I'm just going to put this here and eyeball it the same way I just did that board and I'd be done. And then before I run it, however, I'm going to take this board and I'm going to push it through. Now this hole up here is actually what I use with these magnetic locks. So once I push that thing through, I can pretty much lock that into place so it's not gonna wanna move. And then I can just use this as the surface that I push over and it makes the whole thing entirely safer. And you could actually use this if you wanted to for these boards here, but I just don't really feel a need for it. So that's how we're gonna get the larger sides. So the sides, the fronts, and the backs. Everything except the facets are gonna be done this way. And then we're gonna go take a look at it again once we get to that extra board when we're doing the facets. Okay, so you can see it won't be the fastest thing in the world. I did have the height set initially to the correct height, it's, but you can see now that with this angled the way it's gonna be when it's assembled, I can now put this panel on there and it fits just nice and fine, nice and square. So the other advantages, there's a lot of good glue surface down there for the panel, so that's gonna be fantastic for getting this thing to be locked into place exactly where I want it. 
Now for the small parts, I want to use the sled like we've been using throughout this entire project with the triangles. Now the triangles are actually going to make it that I can put this on here and now it's going to make this block present a straight edge to the blade. So it takes care of all the inclinations and everything like that for me as we've been doing throughout this entire project. So it's great that once you get these things nailed down perfectly, or in my case, taped down perfectly with corrections, then uh, everything just becomes so much easier. Now for this one here, because we have a dado stack on here, it's going to be taking off quite a bit from the sacrificial edge. So I do have a new sacrificial edge on here that we're going to be cutting. I have the blade already angled to the correct bevel cut. Uh, we'll just go run that through and then it'll give us a nice zero clearance edge. It's going to make for nicer, cleaner cuts. So let's go ahead and do a couple here. the rabbits cut on one of the cabinets. I didn't do both cabinets. I decided that uh, there's enough chance that maybe after I go through this I would realize, oh, this one thing is always a problem, but if I do this it makes it that I'll have less work afterwards. I wanted to make sure I did one cabinet first so that any good ideas like that could be carried over to the second cabinet. So I wouldn't have to do as much with the shoulder plane. So I did trim this one here up with the shoulder plane to get everything to be uh, much smoother on these edges here. There are a couple, uh, this facet and this facet, I believe I had the angle incorrect for one of the cuts. So I don't know if in my stack of left and right parts I somehow swapped them, but those are, when I go to the other cabinet and I have everything set up for cutting these facets, I'll go ahead and recut these. Uh, what it will mean is that the facet into the corner here is going to dip down a little further. I'll just call that glue recess and we'll be all over with with that. So. Uh, everything else seems like it's pretty good. I will be gluing this up. So the first cabinet will get all the shell glued up after I do some sanding on the inside. And then from there, we'll be able to cut the panels. Now the panels, though it sounds like we're just going to cut the panels and pop those right in, uh, we are going to actually build that in layers. What, what I'm going to be doing is, now this is a, a top panel, but we will be cutting the panel for the bottom and inserting it and gluing it in place. But then we're going to leave the top panel for later because I need access to be able to get in here to build the drawer assembly. So we'll build the drawer assembly on the inside, get it all glued in, and then once that's ready, then we can cut the top panel and insert it. So it's a little bit of a, little bit of a different order than you normally would do it in square work, but it seems like this is going to be the easiest way to work it. I don't want to be building a drawer assembly while this is all loose like this. And even if I glue it up, there's still going to be a fair amount of flex here. I don't want that in there when I'm trying to build the drawer assembly. So we'll go ahead and do the panels. Now if I change my mind between now and the next episode, I take all that back. <laughs> 